talk will start now and will be Unpatchable, Living with a Vulnerable Implanted Device by Dr. Marie Mo and Aaron Leverett. Give them a warm round of applause, please. So I'm here today to talk to you about a subject that is really close to my heart. I have a medical implant, a pacemaker, that is generating every single beat of my heart. But how can I trust my own heart when it's being controlled by a machine, running on proprietary code, and there's no transparency? So I'm a patient, but I'm also a security researcher. I'm a hacker, because I like to figure out how things work. That's why I started a project on breaking my own heart, together with Aaron and a couple of friends. Because I really want to know what protocols are running in this machine inside my body. Is the crypto correctly implemented? Does it even have crypto? So I'm here to inspire you here today. I want more people to hack to save lives. Because we are all becoming more and more dependent on machines. Maybe some of you in the audience also have medical implants. Maybe you know someone that's also depending on medical implants. Imagine that this is your heartbeat and it's being con controlled by a device. A device that might fail due to software bugs, due to hardware fa failures. Wouldn't you also like to know if it has security vulnerabilities, if it can be trusted? Something to think about, right? Yeah. Marie is an incredibly brave woman, and when she asked me to give this talk, um, it made me nervous, right? It's such a, such a personal story, such a journey as well, and she's going to talk to you about a lot of things, right? Not just um, hacking medical devices from a safety point of view, but also some of the privacy concerns, some of the transparency concerns, some of the consent concerns. Um, so there's a lot to get through in the next hour, um, but I think you're going to enjoy it quite a lot. So let me tell you the story about my heart. Uh, so four years ago, I got my medical implant. It was an, kind of an emergency uh, situation because my heart was starting to beat really slow. So I needed to have the pacemaker. I had no choice. Um, after I got the implant, since I was a security researcher, of course, I started to look up information about how it worked and I Googled uh, for information, I found the technical manual of my pacemaker and I started to read it. And I was quite surprised when I learned that my pacemaker has two wireless interfaces. There's one inf interface that is really close field communication, near field communication, that is being used when I'm at uh, checkups at the hospital, where the technician, the pacemaker technician or the doctor uses a programming device and places it really close to my, my pacemaker and it's possible to use that uh, communication to adjust the settings. But it also has another um, wireless interface that I was not aware of, that I was not informed of as a patient. It has the possibility for remote monitoring or telemetry uh, where you can have an access point in your house uh, that will communicate uh, with a pacemaker uh, on a couple of meters distance and it can collect logs from the pacemaker and send them to a server uh, at the vendor and there's a web interface where the doctor can log in and retrieve my information. And I have no access to the data that is being collected by, by my device. So imagine for a moment that you were buying a new phone or buying a new laptop. You would do your homework, right? You would understand what interfaces were there 
Uh, but in Marie's case, she's just given advice, and then later she gets to go and read the manual, right? So she's the epitome of an uh, informed uh, consumer in this space, and we want a lot more informed consumers in this space, which is why we're giving this talk. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I'm used to hacking industrial systems. I haven't done as much medical research in the past. So when I first started this project, I knew literally nothing about Marie's heart, uh, or even my own. And she had to teach me uh, how the heart works and how her pacemaker works. So would you mind explaining some details to the audience that'll be relevant through the rest of the presentation? Yeah, actually, I think we're going to show you a video of uh, how, how the heart works. So it's a little bit of a biology introduction here before we start with the technical details. So just play the video. Play the video. A normal heartbeat rate and rhythm is called normal sinus rhythm. The heart's pumping action is driven by electrical stimulation within the heart muscle. The heart's electrical system allows it to beat in an organized, synchronized pattern. Every normal heartbeat has four steps. Step one, as blood flows into the heart, an electrical impulse from an upper area of the right atrium, also known as the sinus node, causes the atria to contract. When the atria contract, they squeeze the blood into the ventricles. Step three, there is a very short pause, only about a fraction of a second. And step four, the ventricles contract, pumping the blood to the body. A heart normally beats between 60 to 100 times per minute. Electrical signals in your heart can become blocked or irregular, causing a disruption in your heart's normal rhythm. When the heart's rhythm is too fast, too slow, or out of order, an arrhythmia, also called a rhythm disorder, occurs. When your heart beats out of rhythm, it may not deliver enough blood to your body. Rhythm disorders can be caused by a number of factors, including disease, heredity, medications, or other factors. So for those of you who are already aware of that, apologies, but uh, I needed to learn that. I needed to learn the basics before we even got started, right? So. so this is a diagram of the electrical system of the heart. Uh, so as you see, it's a sinus node that is generating the pulse. And in my case, uh, I had a problem with the, the uh, signal being generated by the sinus node not reaching the lower heart chamber. It's something called a AV uh, block or heart block. Uh, so. Uh, it's a, occasionally, this will cause an arrhythmia that makes the heart pause. If you don't have a heartbeat for like eight, 10 seconds, you, you, you lose your consciousness. And that was what happened to me. I just suddenly found myself lying on the floor and I didn't remember how I got there. And it turned out that it was my heart that had taken a break. So that's how I discovered that I had this, this issue. So. This is where the signal is blocked on the way down to the lower heart chamber. Uh, but there's a backup function in the, in the heart uh, that can uh, make a, uh, a so-called backup pulse. Uh, and I had that uh, backup pulse when I went to the emergency room. So I had a pulse around 30, 40 beats per minute. And that's generated by some cells in the lower heart chamber. So, but after I got the pacemaker, my heart started to become a little bit more lazy. So it's not certain that I will have this backup pulse anymore if the pacemaker stops working. So currently, my heart is 100% running on the pacemaker. So let's also look at how the pacemaker works. I have another video of that. So this is my little friend that is uh, running my heart. A pacemaker is a miniaturized computer that is used to treat a slow heartbeat. It is about the size of a couple of stacked silver dollars and weighs approximately 17 to 25 grams. Approximately. It is usually surgically placed or implanted just under the skin in the chest area. The device sends a tiny electrical pulse down a thin coated wire called a lead into your heart. This stimulates the heart to beat. 
These impulses are very tiny and most people do not feel them. While the device helps your heart maintain its rhythm, it also stores information about your heart that can be retrieved by your doctor to program the device. Remember that. Yeah, you did see the ones and zeros at the end of the video. Uh, that's what we want to know more about, because this information that is being collected by the pacemaker, how it works, how the code looks like, it's all closed source, it's proprietary information. And that's why we need more security researchers, we need more, more third party testing to be sure that we can trust this code. And you can imagine that we're doing some of this research as well. But uh, I'm not going to break Marie's heart on stage. I'm not going to drop O'Day on some medical devices. So if you came for that, um, it's not worth staying. The rest of the presentation will be about some of the things we've found and how this works and how you might approach this research. And some of the people who did this research before, because there's plenty of others. And we'd like to give a shout out to those who've done uh, great research in advance. But essentially, this point is, is very relevant, that the internet of medical things is already here. And Marie is wired into it. Um, she's a bit younger than your average uh, pacemaker uh, patient, but uh, you know she was thrust into this situation where she had to think about things in a very different way. Like you did a, a master's breaking crypto and also a PhD in information security. Did you imagine uh, the things you learned about SSHing and network security might one day apply to your heart and your own body? No, I never figured out that uh, my research would eventually end up inside my own body. That's something I never thought about. And also, there's a lot of uh, people that don't think about how the medical devices actually work. So when I ask this question to healthcare professionals, they look at me like I'm crazy. They, don't, they have never thought about this before, that there actually is code inside my body. And someone has programmed it. Someone has written this code. And did they think about that this, this would actually control someone's life and be my own personal critical infrastructure? Yeah, personal infrastructure, right, on a, on a physical level. And also, um, I think it's, you know, the point that you made is important to reiterate, that you go and see your doctor and you ask these questions about whether anyone can hack into my heart, and they probably look at you and go like, don't you worry your pretty little head about that, right? But Marie used to head up the Norwegian computer emergency response team for a couple of years and uh, knows a lot of hackers and uh, knows what she's talking about, right? So when she asks her doctor these questions, they're very legitimate questions. And the doctors probably don't know anything about code, but they need to move towards a place where they can answer those questions with some honesty and certainty and treat them with the dignity that they, that they deserve. Shall we show them a little bit more about the total ecosystem of devices that we're talking about, at least in this particular talk? Yeah. OK, so this, this was all new to me. I mean, I've, uh, I've moved around in networks and done some penetration testing and some stuff in the past. But um, I didn't know much about implantable medical devices. Um, so we've got a couple of them there, the ICD, uh, which is the uh, in-cardio defibrillator. That's some of the work that you saw from Barnaby Jack, which we'll mention later, was on those particular devices. We've got the pacemakers, and of course other devices could be in this diagram as well, like we could be talking about insulin pumps or, or other things in the future. The device itself speaks to uh, box number two, which we'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, using a protocol uh, commonly referred to as MIX. Um, a number of different devices use this medical implant communication service. Um, and Marie shocked me uh, yesterday when she <laughs> found a couple devices that uh, potentially use Bluetooth. <sighs> so would you like to tell them a little bit more about the access point, and I'll, I'll join in. Yeah, so the access point is the device that you can typically have on your bed stand that will, uh, uh, depending on your configuration, uh, uh, contact your pacemaker at regular intervals, for instance, once during the night. Uh, it will start a, a communication with the pacemaker a couple of meters distance, and we start collecting logs. And these logs will then be sent. Uh, it can be via, via SMS uh, or uh, other means uh, to a server. So there's a lot of my personal um, information that uh, can end up different places in this diagram. So of course it's in my own device. Uh, it will be then 
communicated via this access point, and also then uh, via the cellular network. And then it will also be stored in like the, the telemetry uh, uh, server. Um, potentially, when I when I go for the checkups, my personal information will also end up in my um, my doctor's uh, uh, workstation at uh, or in the electronic uh, uh, patient records. Um, and there's a, a lot of things that can go wrong here. Yeah, you can see it's using uh, famously um, secure uh, methods of communication that have never been backdoored or compromised by anyone ever before, uh, even here at this conference, probably even this time around. Um, so these are some things that, that are concerning. Uh, the data also travels uh, often to other countries, and so there are questions about jurisdiction in terms of privacy laws in terms of some of this data. Um, and some of you can go and look deeper into that as well. Um, the telemetry store thing I think is important. Some of this is a telemetry store, such as the, the server at the vendor. So the vendor owns some machine somewhere that collects data from Marie's heart. So you can imagine she goes to see her doctor and the doctor's like, hey Marie, last weekend, did you um, run a half marathon or something? Uh, you know, and she hasn't told him, right? Like he just can look at the data and see that her heart rate was up for a couple hours. Um, that's true though, right? You did actually run a half marathon. Yeah, I did run a half marathon. <laughs> <laughs> so. so the telemetry store is one part, but there's also the doctor's workstation, which contains a lot of this medical data. So from a privacy perspective, that's part of the attack surface. But there's also the programmers, right? There's the device programmers. So that's, uh, that's an interesting point that I hope a lot of you are interested in um, already, that there is a programmer for these devices. Yeah, so... We actually went shopping on eBay, and we found some of these devices. You can buy them on eBay? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I found a programmer uh, that can program my device on eBay, and I bought it. And also I found a couple of these access points. So that's what we're now starting to look at. Uh, we, yeah. we just wanted to give you an overview of this system, and it's fairly similar across the different device vendors, and we're not going to talk about individual vendors. But if you were going to go and do this kind of research, you can see that some of the research you've already done in the past applies to different parts of this process, right? And talking about patient privacy, when we got the, the programmer from eBay, it actually contained patient information. So that's the really bad thing. So uh, I, I found this very odd. I had this similar reaction to yourselves because I usually do industrial system stuff. One of my friends picked up some uh, PLCs recently and they had data from the nuclear plant that the PLCs had been used in. Um, so de decommissioning is a problem in industrial systems, but it turns out also in uh, medical devices, right? I guess that's a useful point uh, to make as well about the cost of doing this kind of research. It is possible to get some devices, some implants, uh, from people who have sadly passed on, but that comes with a very high cost of biomedical decontamination. So that raises the cost of doing this research on the implants themselves, not necessarily on the rest of the devices. Yeah, so I also want to say that in this research, I have not tinkered with my own device, so that would not be a good thing. You're not gonna I'm let me like SSH into your heart and just, uh, no. just <laughs> delete some stuff, no? No. I wouldn't do it anyway, but it's, it's an interesting point, right? So like, there are a lot of safety precautions that we and the rest of the team have to take when we're doing this research. And one of them is uh, not pairing uh, Marie's pacemaker with any of the devices that are under test. Do you want to say a bit more about connectivity and vulnerability? Yeah, so <clears throat> I was worried when I discovered that uh, I had this possible connectivity to the medical internet of things. Uh, in my case, this is switched off in the configurations, uh, but it's there. It's possible to turn it on. It's possible for me to be uh, hooked up to the, this uh, Internet of Medical Things. And for some patients, this is a really benefit. So you always have to make a risk-based decision on whether or not to, to make use of this uh, in connectivity. But I think it's really important that you make an informed decision about that and that the patient is, uh, is informed and has given uh, his or her uh, consent uh, to, to have this feature. Um, 
the battery lifetime of my pacemaker is around 10 years. So in six years time, I will have to have a replacement surgery and I'm going to be a really difficult patient. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> right on. I, I really want to know uh, how the devices work by then and uh, I want to make an informed decision of whether or not to have this connectivity. Uh, but of course, for a lot of patients, the benefit of having this outweighs the risk. Uh, because uh, people that had other heart problems than me, they have to go uh, for more frequent checkups. I only have to go once a year. So for patients that need to go frequently to, for checkups, it's really good for them to have the possibility of having telemetry and having connectivity to, to, to have remote patient monitoring. Yeah, imagine you have mobility problems or uh, you even just live far from a major city. Uh, and making the journey to the hospital is quite uh, arduous, then this kind of t remote telemetry uh, allows your doctor to keep track of what's going on. And that's, a, that's very important. We don't wanna like, have a big scary testosterone-fueled talk where we like, hack some pacemakers. We wanna talk about how there's a dual use thing going on here and that um, there is a lot of value in having these devices, but we also want them to be safe and secure and preserve our privacy and a lot of other things. So these are some of the issues. Um, of course, the last one, the remote assassination scenario, that's everyone's uh, favorite one to fantasize about uh, or talk about or make movies about. But um, we think there's a lot of other issues in here that are more interesting, some quality issues even, right, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, battery exhaustion, again, something uh, many people don't think about, but uh, I'm very interested in cyber-physical exploitation, and so the, some of those elements uh, were interesting to me, that you might uh, use the device in a way that wasn't expected, right? So personally, I'm not afraid of uh, uh, being remotely assassinated. I've actually never known you to be afraid of anything, but... <laughs> uh, I'm more worried about software bugs uh, in my device, uh, or things that can malfunction. Is that just theoretical? I mean, Oh, actually, software bugs have killed people. So think about that. <laughs> the people that are not here, they don't have their voice and they can't really uh, give their story. But there are stories about persons, depending on medical devices, uh, dying because their device malfunctioned. There's even some great research uh, from academics about how the user interface design of medical devices can have an impact on patient safety and how designing UX much more clearly and concisely, specifically for the medical profession, might improve uh, the care of patients. Do you want to say more about this slide, or should we go on to the previous work? Should we? Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's really important also to uh, the issue of trusting the vendors. Uh, so as a patient, I'm ex expected to just you know, trust that my device is working correctly uh, every security vulnerability has been uh, corrected uh, by the vendor, and it's safe. Uh, but I, I want to have more third-party testing. I want to have more security research on medical implants. And as uh, a lot of things ha like history has shown, uh, we can't always trust uh, that the vendors do the right thing. So. I think this is a good opportunity for us to ask a, a very fun question, which is, any fans of DMCA in the room? <laughs> no? No fans? All right. Well, then you'll really enjoy this. Uh, Marie has some very exciting news about DMCA exceptions. Yeah, so uh, October this year, uh, there was a ruling uh, of a DMCA exemption for security research on medical devices, uh, also for automotive uh, security research. So this means that uh, as researchers uh, you can uh, actually do reverse engineering of medical implants uh, without uh, infringing copyright laws. Uh, it, it, it will take uh, effect I think October next year. Yeah. It is really a big, big step forward uh, in my opinion and I hope that this will encourage more research. And I also I want to mention that there are fellow uh, activist patients like myself that was behind 
this proposal of uh, having these exemptions. Uh, so Jay Redcliffe, who uh, hacked his own insulin pump, uh, Karen Sandler, uh, who is a free and open software advocate, and Hugo Campos, who has an ICD implant. He's very, uh, he wants to have access to his own data for uh, quantified self reasons. So these uh, patients, uh, they actually um, uh, made this happen, that you're allowed to do security research on medical devices. And I think that's really great. Do you want to say something about Scott Irvin's presentation that you saw at DEF CON? Yeah, that was a really interesting presentation about uh, how medical devices have really poor, poor security. Uh, and they have like hard-coded credentials and you can find them using Shodan on the internet. Uh, these were not pacemakers, but other types of uh, different medical devices. Uh, but uh, there are like hospital networks that are completely open and you can uh, access the medical equipment uh, using default passwords that you can find in their uh, manuals. Uh, and the vendors claim that, no, these are not hard-coded, these are default, but then the manuals say, do not change this password. So it's just Because incredible. it won't integrate with other yeah. stuff, right? So, yeah. yeah. And they yeah, also I love put that. Up I've heard that excuse from SCADA, so I wasn't having it. They also put up some medical device honeypots uh, to see if uh, they would get any targeted uh, hacking attempts, uh, but they only picked up like regular um, malware uh, on them, which is also, of only. course, of a concern. <laughs> Anything else about prior Kevin? Yeah, I guess we should mention that uh, the academic research on hacking pacemakers, which was started by a group led by Kevin Fu, uh, and they had this uh, first paper in 2008. Uh, that they also follow up by, uh, with more academic research, and they show that it's possible to hack a pacemaker. Uh, they show that this, this was possible on a, like a couple of centimeters distance only. So like the attack scenario would be if you have a, a device similar to the programmer device and you attack me uh, with it, uh, you can <laughs> turn off my pacemaker. Uh, that's not really scary. But then we have the research by Barnby Jack uh, where this range of the attack is extended to several meters. So you can have someone with an antenna in a room scanning for pacemakers and uh, starting to program them. Um, we, have a, we have a saying at Cambridge about that. Um, uh, the, some of the other people in the university have been doing attacks a lot longer than I have, and one of the things they say is, attacks only get worse, they never get better. So the range might be short one year, and then a couple of years later, it's, it's worse. So the, so. Wor the worst case scenario, I think, would be remotely uh, via the internet being able to hack pace pacemakers. Uh, but there's no research so far indicating that that's possible. And we don't want to hype that up. We don't want to no. get that kind of an angle on this talk. We want to make the point that hacking can save lives, that hackers are uh, a global uh, citizen's resource to save lives, right? So. Yeah, so this is the result of uh, hacking of uh, the drug infusion pumps. Uh, earlier this year, um, the FDA actually uh, issued the first ever recall of a medical device uh, based on cybersecurity concerns. Um, I think that's amazing, yeah. right? They've recalled products because of cybersecurity concerns. They used to have to wait until someone died. In fact, you had to show something like 500 deaths uh, before you could recall a product. So now they can, the FDA, at least in the US, can recall products uh, just based on security considerations. Yeah, so this is also, I guess, the first example of that type of proactive uh, res uh, security research where you can uh, make a proof of concept without killing any patients, and then that closes the, the security holes, and that potentially saves lives, and no one has been hurt in the, in the research. I think that's great. I, I'm also really excited because we give a lot of presentations about security that are filled with uh, doom and gloom and depression. So it's nice to have two major victories in medical device research in the last few years, one being the DMCA exceptions and the other being actual product recalls. Yeah, and the FDA are starting to take these issues seriously and they are 
really focusing on the cybersecurity of medical implants now. I'm going to go to a workshop uh, arranged by the FDA in January and participate in, on a panel uh, discussing uh, cybersecurity of medical implants. And it's great to have uh, this type of interaction between the security community, the medical device vendors, and the, the regulators. So things are happening. Yeah. How do, you, how do you feel as an audience? Are you glad that she is going to be your representative in Washington for some of these issues? And we want you to get involved as well, right? This is not just about uh, Marie and myself and the other people who've worked on this project. It's meant to say you too can do this research and you should be. You have to be a little sensitive and a little bit um, precise and articulate about some of the concerns. We take some inspiration from the former research around hygiene. Imagine the first time some scientists went to some other scientists and said, there's this invisible stuff and it's on your hands and if you don't wash your hands, people get infections and everyone thought they were crazy. Well, it's kind of the same with us, talking about industrial systems or talking about medical devices or talking about hacking in general. People just didn't sort of believe it was possible at first. And so we have to articulate ourselves very, very carefully. So we draw inspiration from that early uh, hygiene movement where they had a couple simple rules that started to save people's lives while they explained germ theory to the masses. Yeah, so this type of uh, research is kind of low-hanging fruits where you just... Uh, so what we show here is an example where uh, 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 there's a lot of uh, uh, medical uh, device networks and hospitals that are open to the internet and that can get infected by normal uh, type of malware, like uh, banking trojans or whatever. And this uh, is potentially a safety issue. <coughs> So if your MR scanner uh, or some other uh, more life-critical device is uh, being unavailable because of uh, a, a virus on it, uh, that's a real concern for patient security and safety. So we need to, uh, to think more about the hygiene also in terms of uh, computer viruses, not only just yeah. normal viruses. So, you know, sometimes people will treat you like this is an entirely theoretical concern, but I think um, this is one of the best illustrations that we've found of, uh, of how that should be a concern, and I think all of you will get it, but I'm going to give you a moment to kind of read what's about to come up on the, on the slides, right? So I'll just let you enjoy that for a moment. So if it's not clear or it's not your first language or something, this guy basically sharded patient data across a bunch of Amazon clusters and then it was unavailable and they were very concerned about the unavailability of their customer patient data sharded across Amazon instances. He was complaining to support, like, can I get support to fix this? <laughs> so all the data of the, the monitoring data of the cardiac patients is unavailable to them because of uh, uh, the uh, service being down. And well, do you want to outsource your patient, patient safety to the cloud, really? Yeah. I don't want that. Okay. I, I wanna, yeah, I wanna get into some other details. We have uh, sort of 10 minutes left if we can, so we can have a lot of questions, and I'm sure there will be some. Um, but I want you to talk to them about this very personal story. Um, this is, remember before when we said, is this stuff theoretical? I want you to pay a lot of attention to the story. It's, it really moved me when she first told me, so. Yeah, so I know how it feels to have my body controlled by a device that is not working correctly. So. I think it was around two or three weeks after I had the surgery. Uh, I felt fine, uh, but I hadn't really done any exercise yet. Um, the surgery was pretty easy. Uh, I only had two weeks uh, sick leave, and then I came back to work. And I went to London uh, to participate in a course in ethical ha hacking. And I, I did take the London Underground together with some of my colleagues, and we went off at this station at Covent Garden. I don't know if anyone of you have been there, but that particular station is really low underground. Uh, they have elevators that you can use to get up, 
uh, but usually there are like long queues to the elevators. You always have to do things the hard you, way. You right? have to take the stairs, or they were just heading for the stairs, and I was following them, and we we're starting to climb the stairs, and I didn't read this warning sign, which says, uh, "Those with luggage, pushchairs, and hard conditions, please use the lift," <laughs> because I was feeling fine, and this was this was the first time that I figure out it's something wrong with my pacemaker or with my heart. Um, because I came like halfway up these stairs and I felt like I was going to die. It was a really horrible feeling. Uh, I didn't have any more breath left. Felt like I, was, I, I wasn't able to complete the stairs. Uh, I didn't know what was happening to me, but somehow, somehow I managed to drag myself up the stairs and I was, my heart was really, uh, didn't feel right. So first thing when I came back, uh, from this course, I went to my doctor and we started to try to debug me, try to find out what was wrong with my pacemaker. And this is how that looks like. Uh, so uh, there's a stack of different uh, programmers. Uh, this is not me, by the way, but it's a very similar situation. And we'll come back to those programmers yeah. in a moment. But the bit I want you to focus on is like they're debugging your pacemaker? Yeah, I didn't know what Inside was, you? I didn't know what was happening at the time. We were just trying to get the settings right, and it took like two or three months before we figured out what was wrong. And what happened was that my upper rate limit was set too low for me, for my age. Uh, so the normal pacemaker patient is maybe around 80 years old, and the, upper, the default upper rate limit was 160 beats per minute. And that's pretty low for a, for a young person. So imagine uh, like you're younger and you're really fit and you know how to do something really well, like swimming or skiing or skateboarding or whatever. You're fantastic at it. And then a couple of years go past and you, know, you gain some weight and you're not as good at it, right? But now imagine that happens in three seconds while you're walking up a set of stairs. Yeah, so what, what happens is that the pacemaker detects, oh, you have a really high pulse and uh, there's a safety mechanism that will cut your pulse in half. So it will go in from half. like... <laughs> So in my case, it went from 160 beats per minute to 80 beats per minute in a second, or less than a second, and that felt really, really horrible. And it took a long time to figure out what was wrong. It wasn't until they put me on an exercise uh, bike and uh, had me on monitoring that they figured out what was wrong, because the thing was that the, what was displayed on the, on the pacemaker technician's uh, view was not the same settings as my pacemaker actually had. There was a software bug in the programmer uh, that caused this problem. So they thought they had updated her settings to be that of a young person. They're like, oh, we've already changed it. But they'd lost the view. They, they couldn't see the actual state of the pacemaker. And the only way to figure that out was to put her on a bike and let her cycle until her heart rate was high, high enough. You know, literally physically debugging her to figure out what was wrong. Now stop and think about whether or not you would trust your doctor to debug software. <clears throat> so say a little bit more about those programmers and then we'll move on towards yeah. the future. Yeah, so, so we got hold of one of these programmers, as you mentioned, and looked inside it. And well, we named this talk Unpatchable because uh, originally uh, my hypo hypothesis was that if you find a bug in pacemaker, uh, it will be hard to patch it. Maybe it would require surgery. But then when we looked inside the programmer and we saw that it contained uh, firmware for pacemakers, uh, we realized that it's possible to actually patch the pacemaker via this programmer. One of the other researchers finds these firmware blobs inside the programmer code, and like my heart stopped at that point, right? I was just going, really? You can just you can just update the code on someone's pacemaker. Um, we also want to say something about standardization. Look at all those different programmers. If someone goes into the hospital with one of these devices, they have many different programmers and they have to make an estimation of which, um, you know, which programmer for which device, like which one are you running. And um, so some standardization would be an option, <laughs> perhaps in this case. All right, so we're going to need to move quickly through the next few slides to talk to you about the future, but I hope that drives home that this is a very real issue for real people. So pacemakers are evolving, and they are getting smaller, and this is the type of pacemaker that you can actually implant inside the heart. So the pacemaker I have today is outside the heart, and then I have the leads that are, leads that are wired to my heart. Uh, but in future, they are getting smaller and more sophisticated, and... Um, 
I think this is ex ex exciting. I think that uh, a lot of you also in the audience will benefit from having this type of technology when you grow older and we can have longer lives and we can lead more healthier lives because of the technology. And keep in mind, right? A, you know, some of you may already have devices and already have these issues, but others of you will think, ah, that won't happen to me for quite a long time. But it can be a sudden thing that, you know, you don't necessarily have a choice to run code inside your body. You know, which OS do you want to implant? <laughs> you want to uh, tell them about yeah, the this cardiac is also, sock? This is also quite exciting, maybe future type of implants that you can have. So this is actually a cardiac sock. It's 3D printed and it's is uh, making a rabbit's heart beat outside the body of the rabbit. So there's a lot of technology and sensors and things that are going to be implanted in our bodies. And I think more of you will become cyborgs like me uh, in the future. <laughs> and there's a lot of work that you could be doing, you know, 3D printing these devices and open sourcing as much of this as possible. There's a lot to say here, right? Um, I think it's time to address the really scary issue uh, the consent, the informed consent issue around patching, right? Remember earlier we were talking about the programmers and we pointed out that there were firmware blobs in there and that these people, you know, your doctor or nurse could upgrade the code running on your medical implant. Now, is there a legal requirement for them to inform you before they alter the code that's running inside your body? As far as we can tell, and we need to look at a lot of different countries at the same time, so we're going to ask you to help us. As far as we can tell, there are not laws requiring your doctor to tell you that they are upgrading the firmware in your device. Yeah, think about that. It's a quite scary thing. I, I want to know uh, what's happening to my implant, uh, the codes. If someone wants to alter the code inside my body, I would like to know and I would like to uh, make an informed decision on that and uh, give my consent before it happens. You might even choose a device where that's possible or not possible because you're making a risk-based decision and you're an informed yeah. consumer, but how do we help people who don't want to understand software and firmware and upgrades make those decisions in the future as well, right? All right. So now if we're going to go through all of this, but there is a lot of reasons why we are in the situation of having insecure medical devices. There's a lot of legacy technology because there's a long lifetime of these devices and it takes a long time to get them on the market. And in, they can be patched, but in some cases they are not patched or there are not, no software updates applied to them. We don't have any security, third party security testing of the, of, uh, the devices. Uh, and that's really needed. In my right, opinion. an underwriter's laboratory or a consumer laboratory that's there to check some of these details. Um, and I don't think that's unreasonable, right? That sort of approach. And there's a lack of regulations also. So there's a lot of things that should be worked on. So there's a lot of ways to solve this and we're not going to give you the answer because we're not uh, geniuses. So we're gonna say that these are some different approaches that we see all playing into um, a solution space. So vendor awareness is obviously important, but that's not the only thing. And a lot of the vendors have been very supportive and very uh, open to discussion, but there's a lot of transparency that needs to happen more in the future, right? Um, security risk monitoring. Uh, I've been working in the field of cyber insurance, which I'm sure sounds like insanity to the rest of you. Um, and it is, there are bad days. But uh, that could play a part in this risk uh, equation in the future. Uh, what about medical incident response, right? Or medical device yeah. forensics? Yeah, if I drop, suddenly drop dead, I really would like to have a forensic analysis of my pacemaker to... Please remember that, yeah. all of you. Like, if anything are, is going to happen to Maria, everyone asked that, right? Like, aren't you afraid of giving this talk? And uh, we thought about it, we talked about it a lot, and uh, she's got a lot of support from her husband and her son and her family and a bunch of us. If anything happens to this woman, I hope that we will all be doing forensic analysis of everything. <clears throat> Cool. So we'll say a little bit about uh, I Am the Cavalry and a social contract, and then we'll wrap it up, okay? Um, so I Am the Cavalry does a lot of grassroots research uh, and support and lobbying and tries to articulate these messages. They have a medical implant arm that has a bunch of different researchers doing this kind of stuff. Um, do you want to say more about them? Yeah. 
So we're both uh, uh, part of the cavalry uh, because no one is coming to save us from the future of uh, being more dependent on tr and trusting our lives on machines. So that's why we need to do, step up and do the research and uh, encourage the, and inspire the research. So that's why I joined uh, I'm the Cavalry. And I think it's a good thing to have a, a collaboration effort between researchers, between the vendors and the regulators as, as they are or we are working with. We also think that even if you don't do reverse engineering or you're not interested in the security details or the opcodes that are inside the firmwares or whatever, this question is a question any of you here can talk about for the rest of the Congress and going forward into the future, right? This is Marie, so go ahead. Yeah, so I really want to know uh, what code is running inside my body and I want to know, uh, or, or I, I want to have a social contract with my uh, medical doctors and uh, my physician that is uh, giving me this implant. Uh, uh, need, it needs to be based on, on the patient-doctor patient uh, trust relationship and uh, uh, also between me and the vendors. So I, I really want to know that uh, I can trust this machine inside of me. And we think many of you will be facing similar questions to these in the future. Um, I have questions. Uh, some of my questions are serious. Some of my questions are not serious, like this one. Um, is the code on your dress from your pacemaker? Uh, no, actually, it's from the computer game Doom. Uh, but um, when, once I have the code of my pacemaker, I'm going to make a custom order dress and get it. Which is pretty cool, right? Own, with my own code. So, so let's wrap up with uh, what, what we want to have of future research. So we encourage more research. And these are some things that uh, could be looked into. Like open source medical devices. That doesn't really exist today, at least not for pacemakers. Uh, but I think that that's... Uh, one way of going forward? I think uh, it's also a, an opportunity for us to mention a really scary idea, which is, you know, should anyone have a golden key uh, to Marie's heart? Should there be backdoored encryption inside of her heart? Um, we think no. <laughs> but I, that, I don't uh, see any reason why the NSA should be able to uh, have a backdoor to my heart. I, you? you would be an extremist. Uh, that's why you don't want them to have a backdoor to your heart. Um, but this is a serious question, right? If you start backdooring any kind of crypto anywhere, how do you know where it's going to end up? It might end up in medical devices, and we think that's unacceptable. And we should also mention that uh, we're not doing this alone. We have, we have other researchers helping us forward doing this. So thank you very much for this thrilling talk. We're now doing a little uh, Q&A for 10 minutes. And for the Q&A, please keep in mind to uh, respect Marie's privacy. So don't ask for details about this, the implant or something like that. Yeah, the brands and stuff. Yeah. We're going to tell you what OS she's running. People who are now leaving the room, they are not, uh, will not be able to, uh, come, to uh, come back in because um, of measures. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's start with the Q&A. Let's start with this microphone there. Hi, first of all, thank you very much for a very fascinating talk. Um, I'm not going to ask you about specific vendors. However, I, I thought it was very interesting what you said that uh, most vendors were really supportive. Uh, I would like to know uh, w whether there have been exceptions to that rule, not who it was or anything like that, but what kind of arguments uh, you may have heard from vendors. For example, have they um, referred to anything such as trade secrets or copyright or any other uh, legal reasons why not to give you uh, or not to give public access to information about devices? Thank you. So um, we haven't had any legal issues so far in this research. Um, and in general, they haven't been concerned about copyright. I think they're more concerned about press, bad press, and, uh, and hype. 
you know, what they would see as hype. They don't want to see us uh, scaring people away from these things with, you know, these uh, stories, right? Yeah, that's also something that I'm concerned of, of course, as a patient. I don't want to scare my fellow patients from having life-critical implants in their body uh, because uh, a lot of people need them, like me, to survive. So the benefit clearly outweighs the risks uh, in my case. But that seems to be their main concern. Like, you know, don't give us too much bad press. OK, okay next question from over there. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you know about any existing initiatives on uh, open sourcing the medical devices, on, on mandating uh, the open sourcing of the software and firmware uh, through the legal system, be it in European Union, in Uni United States, because I think I've read about such an initiatives about a year ago or so, but it was just a glimpse. So there are some patients that have, have reverse engineered their device. pumps. I know that uh, uh, there are uh, groups of patients that, uh, like the parents of children with insulin pumps, they have created software to be able to have an app on their mobile phone to be able to to monitor their, their child's uh, blood sugar levels. So that's one uh, way of uh, doing this open source, and uh, I think that's great. But yeah. nothing in the legal systems, no, no initiatives to mandate this, for example, on European level? Not so far that we've seen, but that's something that can be discussed now, right? So. I think it's really interesting to look into the legal aspects and the regulations uh, around this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, can we have a question from the internet? Yes, from the IRC, uh, someone asks, um, does your peacemaker have a biofeedback, so in case something bad happens, it starts to defibrillate? Uh, no, I don't have an ICD, so it, uh, in my case, uh, I, I'm not getting a shock in case my heart stops, because I have a different uh, condition. I only need to, to have my rhythm corrected. Uh, but there are other types of conditions that require pacemakers that can deliver shocks. Okay, one question from that microphone there. Thank you very much. At one point you mentioned that the connectivity in your pacemaker is off for now. And is that something that patients are asked during the process or is that something patients have to require? And generally, how, what role do you see for the choice not to have any connectivity or any security, for that matter, that technology would, would make available to you? So how do you see the, the, the possibility to choose a more risky life in terms of trading in for privacy, whatever? Yeah, I think that's really a really relevant question. Uh, uh, as we mentioned in the social contract, uh, I really uh, would like that uh, the doctors inform patients about uh, their different uh, wireless uh, interfaces uh, and that there's an informed decision whether or not to switch it on. So I, in my case, I don't have it switched on and there's no, I don't need it, so there's no reason why I need to have it switched on. Uh, uh, but then again, why did I get the implant that has this capability? Uh, I should have had uh, the option of opting out of it, but I didn't get that. Uh, they didn't ask me or they didn't inform me about that before I got the implant. It was chosen for me. And at that time, I hadn't looked into uh, the security of medical devices and uh, I needed to have the implant, uh, so uh, I couldn't really make an informed decision. And a lot of patients uh, uh, that are uh, like older and not so, uh, that don't really understand the technology, they can't make that informed uh, uh, decision like I can. So it's really a complex issue and something that we need to uh, discuss more. Okay, another question from there. Yeah, thanks. Um, as a hacker connected personally and um, uh, professionally to the medical world, how can I educate doctors, nurses, medical people about the security risks presented by connected medical devices. What can I tell them? Do you, do you have something from your own experience I could somehow? Yeah, so the issue with, uh, with software bugs in the devices, I think, is, uh, is a real um, uh, scenario that can happen. 
Yeah, if you chance. can repeat that story of debugging her, like I think that makes the point. And then try and adopt that hygiene metaphor that we had before where you know, people didn't believe in germs and these problems before. We're in that sort of era and we're still figuring out what the scope of potential security and privacy problems are for medical devices. In the meantime, please be open to new research on this subject, right? And that story is a fantastic illustration that we don't need evil hacker typer, you know, Bond villain. We just need failure to debug a programming station properly, right? Thank you very much. Okay, another question from the internet? Yes, from the IRC. 20 years ago, it was a common, it was common that a magnet had to be placed on the patient's chest to activate the peacemaker's remote configuration interface. Is that no longer the case today? It's still the case with some devices, but not with all of them, I think. Yeah, it varies between devices, how they are programmed and how, how long distance uh, you can be from the, the device. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have some medical devices in myself too for insulin pump and uh, sensors to uh, measure the blood uh, sugar levels. Um, I'm busy with hacking that and do write better software for myself because the pump have, do doesn't have the software. Have you ever think about it to write your own uh, software for your pacemaker? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't thought about that <laughs> until now. <laughs> no. Fantastic. I think that deserves a round of applause, though, because that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, another question from there. Well, uh, first off, I want to say thank you that you gave this talk because once it's quite interesting, but it's not that talk anyone of, uh, that is affected could hold. So uh, yeah, it takes quite some courage and I want to say thank you. So. Secondly, uh, thank you for giving me the update. I studied medical technology, but I finished 10 years ago and didn't work in the area. And it's quite interesting to see what happened in the meantime. But now for my actual question, you said you got devices on eBay. Uh, is it possible to get the whole communication chain so you can make a sandbox test of a um, yeah, it's possible device to get uh, devices. It's not so easy to get the, the pacemaker itself. It's quite expensive. And even uh, when we get one, we have some pairing issues and like Marie can't be in the same room when we're doing certain types of testing, and right? So that last uh, piece is difficult, but the rest of the chain is pretty available for research. Okay, thank you. Okay, sadly time is running out, so only we, we have only time left for one question, and from there, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm also involved in, in software quality checks and, and uh, software QS here in Germany, also with, with medical uh, developments. And as far as I know, it's um, the most restricted yeah, area of developing products, uh, I think, in the world. It's, it's just easier to manipulate software in a car, exhaust system, or braking guard, or something like this, where you don't have to show any testing certificates or something like this. The FDA is very high regulation uh, part there. Do you have the feeling that it's a general issue that patients do not have access to these FDA compliant tests and, and software QA systems? Yeah, I think Thank that uh, we should have more uh, openness and more transparency uh, about around these issues, really. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's fantastic you do quality assurance. I used to be in quality assurance. Um, at a large corporation and I got tired and went and started doing pen testing. And then I just thought of myself as paramilitary quality assurance. Right? Like now I just do it on whatever I want to test, right? So thank you for doing QA and keep doing it. Um, and hopefully you don't have too many regulations, but companies sharing more of this information is really the transparency and the discussion, the open dialogue with a patient and a doctor and a vendor is really uh, what we want to focus on and, yeah. and make our final note. Yeah. Yeah? We see some progress already the yeah. last year. So uh, the I Am The Cover group has had uh, some great uh, progress on having uh, good discussions with the FDA. Uh, 
and also involving the medical device vendors in the discussions about cybersecurity of medical devices and implants. So that's great, and I hope that this will be even better next year. And I think you wanted to say one more thing to Congress before we leave, which is? Hack to save lives. Thank you very much. Uh,